My name is John Pass, and I'm going to read from my novel in a moment. Uh, the title of this video will be Eisenstein, Video 2, The Methods of Repression. Uh, here is the book itself, Death Day, The Apology of Sergei Eisenstein, a novel by John Passfield. And I'll read the uh, general summary from the back cover before I talk about this particular topic. On March 19, 1937, world-renowned Soviet filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein appears before the All-Union Creative Conference of Workers in Soviet Cinematography, accused of having failed to create films which reflect the social and political orthodoxy of the Stalinist regime. Reeling from an unrelenting barrage of questions, accusations, and threats, the filmmaker struggles to respond to the dilemma which is faced by all artists in totalitarian states. How to reconcile one's freedom of imagination and creativity with the conformity to the artistically stifling orthodoxy which is demanded by the rulers of his society. His response is an example of the ingenuity which has often been displayed by artists in brutally repressive societies. So, in this novel, Sergei Eisenstein is on trial for the crime of being an individual, an individual filmmaker in a society which demands that all art present and promote a single and narrow social agenda. The struggle for artists in repressive societies is to remain independent in their deepest thoughts of the forces that seek to turn them against their better selves. As the novel goes on, the inner force of artistic independence battles with the outer force of artistic repression for control of the mind of the artist Eisenstein. All serious literature presents a battle of imagery his struggle, then, is to cling inwardly to the imagery of his artistic career in the face of a firestorm of the propaganda imagery of the repressive state. As he stands on trial on the stage at the Bolshoi Theater, there are many images in the mind of the main character, Sergei Eisenstein, over 50,000 words of imagery in this novel. But, for this reading, I will isolate one image in each of seven of the 18 chapters of his thoughts. Now, if you think of George Orwell and the concept of the repressive state, Orwell saw that it's the control of the imagery by which people think that these uh, leaders of society uh, seek to exercise. They want to control the imagery inside our minds. So they attempt to limit the imagery that is available as a language by which their people think. They also attempt to internalize state-sanctioned imagery so that the citizen thinks correctly according to the rulers of that state. So they not only limit the imagery that, that comes into your mind through your ears, through your eyes, that's a language by which you think and without uh, some of the components of that language in, in Orwell in 1984, they're cutting words out of the dictionary, in effect. Uh, in effect, what they're cutting out is the images that those words evoke, you know, rebellion and repression and uh, freedom and so on. So Orwell saw that as a battle of images. So they limit the imagery that comes into your mind by which you can think. They put imagery in your mind by which they want you to think. So let's go to the reading then. Uh, Chapter 1, Apology 1, page 6, is this first uh, item I want to read. Uh, Sergei Eisenstein is a, a filmmaker in Soviet Russia. At first, he has the freedom to move around and make his films. And he comes across uh, uh, different uh, indications that uh, all is not right in his society. So here's the first one. The state of Soviet society, deciphering the stories between the lines. The newspaper page is rustling softly. In the reading room, now here in quotations is the passage from the newspaper. These people are traitors, self-confessed, condemned as enemies of the party and the state by the words of their own poisonous lips. Now, 
prose is statement and does not need to be interpreted. So the people who are writing these newspapers in Soviet Russia are making what they consider to be statements. That's it. Just accept it. Don't even think about it. Don't interpret it. But Sergei Eisenstein, an intelligent fellow, wants to interpret this. You know, what's the meaning behind this statement? Poison from the lips of traitors. So difficult to figure out the truth. And what seems to be difficult to process is that normally guilty people say I'm innocent and normally innocent people say I'm innocent. But these people who are traitors, so-called traitors in Soviet Russia, are claiming that they're guilty. It just doesn't seem to suit human nature. So most people will read that, oh yeah, these uh, people have been caught in traitorous circumstances and they've admitted that they're traitors and been put to death. But a more thoughtful person says, well, all I'm getting is a statement in the newspaper. I can't talk to neighbors and friends. We're all pretty careful about what we say about our concerns about the way society is operating, but uh, I'll do a little thinking here. And yet at the same time, do you really want to think about these things, eh? Much more comfortable and safe to just say, well, okay, I'll just read it and leave it at that. Let's go to page 36, leaving out a lot of images in the mind of Sergei Eisenstein. Excuse me, an itchy nose here. Um, but just focusing on these particular questions in his mind. The state of Soviet society, tear-filled eyes and a whispering voice, listening to words that I would prefer not to hear. Revelations as we walk beside the pond, and then here in quotation marks are the words, the things that I have seen and heard. These are very dark days for the country that we love. Words passed on in agony, purporting to bear witness to the truth while purporting these words need to be interpreted. Is it true that these are dark days for their society? I mean, if you're catching all the bad people, uh, maybe that's good news, right? The other thing is friend or neighbor. I mean, everybody's very cautious in a totalitarian society. Is he drawing you on? You know, is he giving his sincere feelings that things are wrong in society? Or is he simply saying that to draw you out so he can turn you in? You know, maybe he's a, an agent with a quota. How many... Uh, traders, have you caught today? Have you caught one lately? Oh, yes, I caught Sergei Eisenstein. As soon as I started to talk negatively about our society, he chimed in. So very, very cautious, right? So the line is um, listening to words that I would prefer not to hear. Do you really want to know that there's something wrong? What are you going to do about it when you do know? Uh, keep quiet in agony or, you know, become subversive and suffer the fate of so many of these dissidents? It's a, a difficult situation to be in. And Sergei Eisenstein, of course, is a public person. He, um, a private citizen, a normal citizen, I guess we could say, a non-artistic citizen, could just walk around with thoughts in his mind or her mind, very unhappy with the state of society. But a filmmaker really has to put himself out there. He has to get permission uh, to work while well, everybody in that society has to get permission to work. But I mean, he has to, he has to produce his work publicly. He has to make films. He has to make films that hopefully he believes in. So does he really want to know that something is wrong? Would that affect his film career? Affect his film career because other people might take it away from him, but affect his film career and that he might make films that uh, he's not satisfied with, propaganda films, or that he is satisfied with but are dangerous because they're putting his ideas out there in the form of imagery for others to evaluate, interpret, and realize what he's thinking. Let's go to page 71. Again, leaving out so many images for the purposes of this reading. A private moment in an out of the way place. A placid pond with nary a ripple. A quiet voice speaks words that sound as if they are torn from a bleeding throat. Again, the words in quotation marks. You see how they do it, don't you? They question you about your motives. They wonder what could have possessed you to say what you have said or to do what you have done. They undermine your confidence to the point where you are no longer sure about your most deeply held convictions. Finally, they make you a hostile witness against your better self. So this is the attempt by the state, not just to uh, try you and condemn you and punish you. Uh, in a free state, of course, if you're in, on trial, 
you have hostile witnesses, but they are other people than yourself speaking against you. Here, there's an attempt to make you the hostile witness against yourself for you to stand in court and claim that you are the guilty traitor. They try to get inside your mind and alter your mind. And that's what this person is uh, complaining about, warning about. Um, well, fine to know this. How in the world are you going to uh, live with it, resist it if you can? Page 102, really moving to the novel, leaving out an awful lot of images in the mind of Sergei Eisenstein, including images about the films that he's making. Page 102, a series of meetings that instinct tells me I should try to avoid. Hey, moving deeper into this sense of what's really happening in society underneath the words of propaganda that he's reading. The pleading voice, the bloodshot eyes, a conversation as we stroll past a grove of poplar trees. Again, in quotes, here's the voice. Zinoviev, Kamenov, Erdokimov, Smirnov. The list is very long. All were prominent communist leaders. All have confessed in open court and been immediately shot. Do you think that all of them have betrayed the mother soil? Threats to relatives, deprivation, hours of torture, searing pain, breaking down the will and planting the seeds of doubt. It is the mind that they are after. It is an all-out attack on the core of each man's soul. What man would not confess to being a traitor to his society when he has lost all sense of the rightness of what he has done? And as I've said in other videos and in my uh, notes, um, all of serious literature is really... Uh, about the battle for control of the mind, I think. And uh, oftentimes the battle with the self, sometimes, uh, well, always maybe the battle with others. If you think of Iago and Othello, you know, and the, uh, the idea that a, another person puts imagery in your mind that actually poisons your mind, makes you think to your own detriment. I mean, that's a classic uh, situation, I think, which is often repeated in literature, you know, the poisoning of the mind by an outside force that becomes an inside force. And that's what the danger is in a repressive state for an artist, but also for every citizen. Page 134 is the next installment. A stroll along the grass beside the pond, the raw voice and the watery eyes of the half insane. Why was I chosen to be the recipient of such words of pain? Here is the voice. Piatikov, Radek, Sokolnikov, Serebryakov, and many, many more all confessed in open court to counter-revolutionary activities and to working as spies for foreign nations. All were taken out and shot, and all have been quite prominent in the party. Their roles in the party have been taken by those who condemned them to death. A public trial? a paucity of evidence, a contrite confession. They have all stood in the docket and humiliated themselves as they begged for forgiveness from their fellow proletarians. But why are the most loyal and prominent communists the ones to confess? So again, uh, the information in the newspapers is that these people were guilty of being traitors. They confessed and they were done away with. But the logic behind it, you know, the people who are accusing them are the people a little below them in the communist hierarchy. Those same people appear the next day having taken the job of the person they condemned uh, to death. What's logical about that? What is the logic behind the logic, I guess you'd say? Let's go to page 164 for another installment of the same uh, image level in the mind of uh, the main character, Sergei Eisenstein. Grim lines round the mouth and fierce eyes, a voice that bores relentlessly into my skull. Words so painful that I would rather turn away. And in quotes, the words. Brutality, exhaustion, starvation, disease, and the debilitating cold of the labor camps. One is utterly helpless once he falls into the hands of those who oppose him. 
interrogation, sleeplessness, and torture are certainly weapons at their command, but what appeals to the most is the psychological pressure that can persuade one that it is a virtue to conform. They make one feel that it is traitorous to oppose them. They make one apologize for one's entire lifetime of achievement. They make one repudiate the most precious of one's ideals. Well, this conversation is a memory for Sergei Einstein because at the moment of the whole novel, he's standing on stage at the Bolshoi Theater defending his whole life and career to his fellow filmmakers. And the subtitle, which I chose, is The Apology of Sergei Eisenstein. And the line here is, they make one apologize for one's entire lifetime of achievement. They make one repudiate the most precious of one's ideals. Well, he is doing that. He's repudiating uh, his uh, motives, I guess you'd say, uh, admitting that he wasn't a, an ideal communist when he made those films. But does does he really mean it? You know, is he succumbing to this process, which is being outlined by this voice, whether one person or a number of pe per people he's uh, spoken to and listened to over the years? Is he actually uh, undergoing this process where he's losing control of his uh, his own thoughts? the imagery of his own thoughts, or is he uh, keeping control of his thoughts and actually uh, figuring out a way, hopefully, to subvert this whole process of the hostile takeover of the, of the mind by the forces of society, of a negative repressive society in this case. Let's go to page 184. This will be the final one of this particular image layer in the level of the mind of the main character. A raw voice on a park bench as we sit and throw breadcrumbs to the swans. A desperate man in a brutal time. His words are fearful words to hear. His words are filtered through my thoughts of making films. And again, in quotes here, quotations, here are the words. One must prepare oneself like a monk for the coming ordeal. The experience is predictable. Arrest, torture. Confession, accusation, doubt, apology, the pattern is always the same. There are whole procedures to make one doubt one's better self. The forces against one in such a situation can be overwhelming. The disapproval of one's superiors, the sense of betrayal of one's colleagues, the disappointment of one's family and friends, all will find their echoes in the inner voices of the undermining self. Wave after wave of persuasive voices will wash over your weary head, eventually speaking with your own familiar tongue. The undertow will be enormous, but you must resist being carried away. Your only lifeline will be to never doubt who you are. Well, that's the warning that he... Uh, the series of warnings that Sergei Eisenhower keeps thinking about at some level of his mind as he's standing on stage on trial in the Bolshoi Theater in 1937 during these great Stalinist purges of society. Uh, there's two kinds of imagery, you might say. There's uh, brutal imagery, which I, which I would say all of this has been an example of. There's also human imagery. So let's look at page 161, moving back through the novel. At another layer of imagery, and I'll just read one example, but it's uh, it's uh, it's imagery that is repeated with different names throughout the novel. So it is another layer of imagery in the mind of Sergei Eisenstein, the main character of this novel. Here's one example of it. The other was like brutal, soulless imagery, and this is human imagery, uh, still coming from inside the experience of a repressive state. I lie awake far into the night and toss and turn. My pillow and my sheets are soaked in sweat. Voices cry out to me that they have been terribly wronged. Mark Solovich Simkovich, head of a planning department, arrested July 18, 1936. The charge was participation in a counter-revolutionary Trotskyist organization. Sentenced to death, October 5, 1936, shot to death, 
two days later. Alexandra Yakolevna Klimova, a medical bookkeeper, arrested October 4, 1932. The charge was counter-revolutionary terrorist activities. Sentenced to death January 2, 1933. Shot to death February 27, 1933. Vladimir Diomedovich Ostachenov, a shipyard mechanic, arrested February 2, 1933. The charge was counter-revolutionary activities. Sentenced to death March 8, 1933. Shot to death March 20, 1933. So all of these images uh, run through uh, the mind of Sergei, Im uh, Sergei Eisenstein. Images at different levels of his mind, all having an effect on his thoughts. Here's a note that I wrote as I was working on the, the novel. In the early days of the Russian Revolution of 1917, imagery of the people who thought themselves to be on the winning side, the filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein among them, felt themselves to be living at last in an open and free society in which everyone as an individual was free to contribute ideas for the betterment of society with the expectation that the best ideas would survive and prosper, and the weakest ideas would inevitably fade away. In this euphoric social atmosphere, Sergei Eisenstein was able to make his film Battleship Potemkin without supervision or censorship. Then came the second phase in Soviet life. Those who held power in the new society decided on the ideas which they considered to be orthodox. And in their wish to speed up change in society, they prohibited all but the most acceptable ideas. This is the state of Soviet society in 1937, when Sergei Eisenstein's film Bezen Meadow has been halted in mid-production, and he is on trial for what the leaders of his society consider to be traitorous ideas. Now, there are two questions in the mind of the main character as he undergoes his ordeal. Will he get to make another film? And if he is allowed to do so, excuse me for just a second, will he be forced to make an acceptably orthodox film? Or will he, by the fascinatingly ambivalent language of imagery, be able to make the film that he wishes to make? Now, all that's in the novel, of course. It's the film Alexander Nevsky, which he hopes to make. The imagery from that film is in the novel, and I'll, I'll read from that in another video. Uh, but imagery is fascinating. Like when I read in a biography of Eisenstein that Hitler and Goebbels liked Battleship Potemkin, I stopped short. What? They liked a communist film? Well, it didn't make Hitler and Goebbels communists, even though it was communist propaganda. There's surface imagery, which you and I would probably think of Battleship Contemporary. Oh yeah, surface imagery, communist propaganda. But there's also deeper imagery, you know. Uh, Hitler and Goebbels, I think, admired it as propaganda and thought, well, you know, instead of the red flag being hoisted at the end of that film, if you'd had a similar situation, in, you know, in, in a German experience and hoisted the swastika at the end, that would make a magnificent Nazi propaganda film. So like imagery works on so many levels, you know, it worked on a different level for Stalin when he watched this new film, 1925, Battleship Potemkin. Then it worked for Hitler and Goebbels when they watched this, you know, recent film in the late 20s, early 30s, you know. Uh, very, very fascinating how imagery works and works in the minds of we humans. Uh, the novel is, once again, I'll just hold it up here, Death Day, uh, The Apology of Sergei Eisenstein. Let me get it straight. A novel by John Paschal. It's available on Amazon. If you have a look there, you can buy it. Two free books uh, are on my uh, website, johnpassfield.ca, J-O-H-N-P-A-S-S-F-I-E-L-D.ca. I always write a planning notebook while I'm working on a novel. I always write a journal of response to that novel as I'm polishing it. What have I accomplished? Where do I go from here as a novel writer? All kinds of topics that, that the topic of uh, the recently finished novel uh, brings up. Just go to the top and click on notebooks, click on journals, go down to the icons and you get those two books of my notes for free. Lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching.